Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Scary Moments Found in Family Friendly Games from the Iceberg. I'm Gambito Gaming, welcome. And if you haven't seen the previous episodes, they'll be listed down in the description. We've done three other videos on the subject at this point, so they'll be down there. This subject is one that keeps bringing me a mixed bag of emotions each time I sit down to talk about it. Like, for one, I'm lost in nostalgia remembering all of these strange moments I had forgotten about since. But on the other hand, I'm remembering the strange moments that I probably forgot for a reason, you know? These are some deep, repressed memories, guys. Anyway, not to sound too dramatic, I do want to say a good few of the entries are sourced from the comments of the last video, and I do invite anyone and everyone who has had a scary experience from a kids or even non-horror game to drop it in the comments below. You might see me talk about it in the next video, wouldn't that be a wild time? Anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and hop into some more scary moments. We talked a little bit about Harvest Moon, A Wonderful Life in the last video, but today I, I, I kind of want to focus on something creepy that surrounds the character Dr. Hardy. The doc arrives to Forget-Me-Not Valley to care for the character Romana early on in the game. After a while, Dr. Hardy will move into town and you can become more friendly with him and he'll start to reveal some stuff about himself. Specifically stuff like his eye, which he states he lost while helping a patient with a contagious disease that eventually took out his own eye. He's pretty dedicated. You can't say much about the guy, but he's at least dedicated, right? Another little weird moment that comes from Dr. Hardy is when he gives the player a scythe that he claimed he used during surgeries back in the day, and he tells the player to be very very careful with it. Yikes, I bet he sliced a couple limbs off with this thing, huh? However, I find one of the creepiest things in A Wonderful Life comes from something Dr. Hardy himself says. And no, it's not about his gross K. Rule eye this time. Instead, it does involve a pretty heavy spoiler for A Wonderful Life, so slight spoiler warning here. But it comes after Dr. Hardy moves into the old house Nina and Gallen lived in after Nina died moving into year two. And thus, uh, Gallen will move into a small shack on a hill near Nina's grave. If you do actually see Dr. Hardy near Nina's grave, sometimes you can get the dialogue from Dr. Hardy that reads as following. Visiting a grave like this makes me realize how very powerless we are as doctors in the grand scheme. Speaking of which, I was walking around here a few nights ago and I heard a girl screaming. Perhaps this is referring to the tortured spirit of Nina screaming out for Gallen at night, but this could also be referring to something else entirely. It's kind of hard for me to believe that this would be the spirit of Nina since she was a very calm and kindred spirit, so I assume in the afterlife she wouldn't feel tortured, but who really knows? This could also just be a strange ambient sound that maybe comes echoing into Forget-Me-Not Valley late at night. There's been no official confirmation on what this text is referring to in the game, so for now we just have to assume, you know, Dr. Hardy is about that paranormal life. He's into this shit. I, I heard from Takakura that he owns the box set of A Haunting on Blu-ray back home. He doesn't share that with a lot of people, but they're pretty good buds. This likely won't be the last time we talk about the disturbing nature of A Wonderful Life, but for now, let's go ahead and move on. Thanks for the suggestion. This comment from the last video brought up Re-Deads, an enemy from the Zelda series, and they specifically named the ones from Wind Waker scaring them the most. Today, I want to mention Re-Deads again, because I believe I mentioned them previously in one of these videos, but this time give them kind of a bigger lane than the last time I talked about them. They have shown up in most mainline Zelda games and have very different designs to fit the different art styles of these games. I think in my opinion, without a doubt, these are the scariest Zelda enemies in, in at least the games they appear in. Holy shit! Sure, you have things like the Wallmaster that are definitely a little unnerving, but there's something extra for me about the Rededs that just make them so disturbing. Maybe it's the way they moan in Link's ear all seductively. <laughs> Or how about they could freeze Link in place with their impenetrable gaze, and they can even choke Link out like some sort of botched WWE finisher. Either that or he's humping Link here, which I don't even want to think about. The enemy is most known from the earlier 3D Zelda games, Ocarina of Time, and Majora's Mask where they can be seen doing a little jig. These guys are getting down and dirty with it. Throw your ass in the circle. Anyway, Rededs can usually be heard before they're spotted due to this large droning moan they do which echoes off of walls. Hell, in Wind Waker specifically, the Redead has this loud, ear-blistering shriek it does right before it attacks Link. My first experience with Rededs was actually in Super Smash Bros. Melee in the classic mode. 
This would have players play a small side-scroller section, and much like in the Zelda games it's featured in, the re-dead can stalk the player and grab a hold of them. They aren't really that dangerous in this mode and serve to really just slow the player down. However, this doesn't change the fact that even in a game like Super Smash Bros, the effect of these monsters are still felt. These are some of the most unnerving enemies Nintendo has ever made, and I'm so glad they were brought back in Tears of the Kingdom. Welcome home, homie. We all desperately missed you. We were all singing your praises while you were gone. Totally not wishing you would never come back. Super Mario Odyssey is one of Mario's more bright and colorful games. Sure, it's got dark corners and some creepy enemies here and there, but overall, if I were trying to play the scariest Mario game, Odyssey would be pretty low on that list. However, no matter how not scary a game is, it's still gotta have a scariest part, right? If you visit the Wooded Kingdom and look around a little bit before jumping to your death immediately, nah, just kidding. But if you do jump off a cliffside in the starting area, you will come to an area known as the Deep Woods. The Deep Woods automatically takes players out of the normal atmosphere of the Wooded Kingdom and of the rest of the game, and puts them in a more calm and serene environment where there's no catchy background music and everything seems at peace. That is until you walk a few steps and awaken the owner of this here deep woods. Yeah, there's a giant T-Rex down here. Luckily he's only present at one half of the map so unless you drag him across the map you really don't have to worry about him unless you're down there. However, to get some collectibles down here, you have to wreck the T-Rex into different things to unlock them. This means you are forced to run from the T-Rex at mock speeds to collect everything down here, which, damn. Not only that, but the only way you can get out of the deep woods is by collecting a seed and planting a vine in order to climb back out. You can't even fast travel out of here. The, 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 the brush is too deep down here, guys. You can't even get the fucking ship down here. This really puts an emphasis on the need to hurry and escape because, well, this thing is hunting you pretty much the whole time you're down here. It's a great segment in an otherwise not at all scary game, and it kind of comes out of nowhere too as you're most likely expecting death if you were exploring hard enough around the entrance to the deep woods. You know, you literally have to careen yourself off a cliff to find it. This is one of my favorite areas in Mario Odyssey because not only is it terrifying, but it can also be the most blissful as it's just you and Mario in the surrounding deep forest you're stuck in. Not to mention you can transform into a Christmas tree here, so easily the best area in the game. 10 out of 10. We've talked a good bit about Super Paper Mario in this series thus far, and there is even more within the game's story that is worth talking about surrounding more disturbing and dark themes. One of the most bleak things that happens in the game comes in Chapter 6 after the game visits the Samur's Kingdom. This is a traditional Japanese-themed level and featured a duel of a hundred tournament which resembled the pit of a hundred trials from the Thousand Year Door, in which you take on a hundred rounds of enemies, and it's kind of an endurance run to survive until the very end. Trust me, this was pretty tough. I at least never was able to accomplish it in either of the games. The other thing Samur's Kingdom is known for is being the place that gets demolished by the void that seemingly follows the player for most of the game. The void fully destroys the Samur's Kingdom and the player wakes up in a white void. I can only compare to the void Squidward got stuck in in that future episode of Spongebob. You know, alone, alone, alone that one. It is the embodiment of a void. Devoid of color, structures, background, skybox, anything anything and everything you can think of is missing. The player is expected to keep walking to the right side of the screen even though there is no guarantee that there will be anything on the other side. The absolute feeling of desolation and overall loss this makes the player feel is almost unmatched, at least by another game with an E rating, right? Luckily though, the kingdom does end up getting restored, but this doesn't lessen the effect of the initial shock of the void and the villain's plan finally working. This was part of the story, so if you saw the game all the way through, you would naturally run across this sequence and this alone proves that Super Paper Mario has one of the most unique, disastrous, and ambitious stories I've ever seen in a Mario game. And when the other stories go something like this, I mean the bar isn't so high, but this just exceeded everyone's expectations. The game known as Tulip was a game that had gone unnoticed on my radar and many others who might have enjoyed this game back in the day. This is mostly due to a limited Japanese release initially in 2002, then five years later it getting released on PS2 in North America. The game was developed by Punchline and published by Natsumi, at least the North American version, which is why it shares visual similarities to the aforementioned Harvest Moon A Wonderful Life. The game is centered around this little dude here who has a dream of kissing his dream girl but is awoken to find out it was just a dream. 
After moving to a new town, the girl of his dream turns out to be there, but ultimately rejects the main character due to his financial standing. Oof. Damn, boy. That one hurts. It's, a, it, it's kind of a big point in this game. You're coming in with knives and lint in your pockets. That's it. Anyway, so you have to play out your day-to-day -day life in Tulip by helping people in the town and eventually earning their trust to give you a smooch? Am I reading that right? Somehow this will impress the girl of his dreams the more and more he gets smooches to the point that by the end of the game the character's hard work finally pays off and he gets to share his gross herpes ridden lips with the girl of his dreams. It's kind of a strange premise for a game but seeing as it comes out of Japan I think we've all seen a little weirder is all I'll say. The game not only having a strange premise it also acts a lot like a wonderful life with the surrounding atmosphere of the game feeling a little bit off. It's unnerving to say the least, and I think it has a lot to do with the world building of the game and the way of the environments and the characters in Long Life Town. Especially in terms of characters, as some of them are not only visually disturbing, but have strange backstories that you get to experience as you help them out for that oh-so-sweet smooch. Take, for example, Dr. Dandy, who has a split personality similar to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. During the day, he's just regular Dr. Dandy, but upon nightfall, he turns into this strange vampire-like version of himself. But they finally came out. Oh god. I think you got a little close, Mal. I did. If the poor boy interacts with this nighttime form of the doctor, he will ask him for a blood donation. And if the player chooses yes, the doctor will drain blood from poor boy, doing 20 points of damage to the player. And if you choose no, the doctor will ask your blood type, and depending on your answer, he may still just attack you anyway. He's a dick. At least his nighttime form. It is stated that the doctor suffers from insomnia throughout the day. And really no wonder why, right? When he's out gallivanting at night like this. Dr. Dandy isn't the only creepy character wandering the streets of Long Life Town as the police officer is visually pretty unnerving too. He just doesn't look human at all, and rather looks like some guy in a mascot suit or something. You'd see this guy doing the damn gritty on a football field before you see this guy actually fucking enforce something. Not only this, but if poor boy is out late at night, this guy basically acts as a turret system to kill anything that is out past curfew. Yeah, this guy will just straight gun you down in the blink of an eye. Oh, come on! God damn, that policeman's a bit, um, trigger happy, isn't he? There's a bit of information about the policeman that claims he suffers from twos on awe disease, which is a very awful disease. I'm sure we've all heard of it, which uh, plagues the victim with, wait, what? Wait, 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 wait. Is that just wanna shoot backwards? He suffers from wanna shoot disease. What the fuck? Even in the Japanese one, it translates to wants to shoot a pistol. All right, this guy is pretty problematic. We're just gonna move on. Tulip has definitely caught my eye and my attention, and I'm very curious to see more of what the game has, as there seems to be a lot hidden in the game. Like, for example, you could smoke in the game and it damages your health. That's like an oddly cool detail I wouldn't expect in a game like this. Anyway, the world of Tulip is a very strange one, and I don't know about the ethics of kissing an entire town's population, including a cop that might just mag dump anyone out past 8 p.m., but hey, maybe I just have to see the game through. That's my problem, I haven't played the game. A lot of people say the second Donkey Kong Country is the best one, and I would have to agree with that statement, but the third one doesn't get enough credit for a lot of things, but the main thing is its creative level design in my opinion. A bunch of the levels featured throughout the third game took the idea of a traditional platforming game and took it to a whole new level, and one of the ways they did this was reinventing the traditional platformer water level straight into a nightmare. In the 15th level of the game known as Fish Food Frenzy, you are expected to guide this hungry fellow throughout the level. He just kind of shows up next to the Kongs without much notice and the game doesn't inform you of what you have to do so it's up to the player to figure out this level's gimmick. That is to keep this guy's belly full because if he's hungry he goes into an all out snack attack and will see the Kongs as big pieces of filet manon dude. That's right, if you don't keep this guy satisfied by eating his favorite fish in the level, he'll turn on the Kongs and hurt the player. So it's a real balancing act between keeping this guy fed and racing to the next piece of food. To make it all worse, you can't let this guy eat everything in the level because if he eats these urchins, it will push him further into his hunger-fueled spaz attack, so you really want to keep to this asshole's strict diet. It's like guiding a celebrity to their favorite steakhouse in Hollywood, but if you don't give them mints along the way, they shoot you in the back of the head. In all honesty, this is one of the most tense water levels in a 2D platformer. Not only did they flip the idea of a water level on its head, but they were also able to make the player learn the weird gimmicks of a level throughout. I mean, come on guys, this is where we're firing on everything they had. This isn't the only thing that can be described as unnerving in the game. Hell, even that area's boss is just a face in the waterfall, which, Jesus Christ. But this level definitely stands 
stands out amongst the other more tame water levels in the genre. Admittedly, I didn't play a lot of Pikmin 2, or at least I thought I remembered playing more than I actually did. The game actually gets pretty deep, introducing things like the cave systems into the series, which was recently brought back in Pikmin 4. This is such a great way to break up the regular grind of a Pikmin game, and they were missed in Pikmin 3, at least for me. Regardless, we did already talk about a creature from Pikmin 2 in the series, that being the Water Wraith. I'm proud to finally say I've gone mono y mono with this big fuck, because they finally brought him back in Pikmin 4. Much like in Pikmin 2, this thing stalks the player throughout each level of the cave and shows up if the player hasn't gathered everything fast enough. However, I think I may have found a Pikmin enemy that unnerves me more than the Water Wraith. Sure, the Water Wraith is undefeatable without the use of purple Pikmin, but I find this next creature is way more deadly. The Smoky Prog is a creature that first appeared in Pikmin 1 as an optional boss, but one of the toughest in the game and maybe even the series. The creature is about the size of a full-grown bulb orb and has this ghastly deadly poison following in its wake. This gas is extremely dangerous to Pikmin and pretty much disintegrates them when they come into contact with it. The boss could be found in the distant springs in Pikmin 1 and you would only have one opportunity to fight the boss there, so it's pretty rare in that game. I'd say it's one of the hardest bosses in the series due to how much health it has and how easy it is to lose your Pikmin to. You'll want to use a lot of bomb rocks on this guy if you even want to save half of your Pikmin population when fighting him. The Smoky Prog reappeared in Pikmin 4, which is the first encounter I had with this dude. He appears in the new Night Expedition mode in the game and is able to be fought several times throughout. The new Night Expeditions allow the players to explore the game's areas at night and have them survive a tower defense gameplay loop that is actually really satisfying and is one of my favorite new additions to the series. Anyway, in Night Expeditions, much like the Water Wraith, if you take too long in the expedition an egg will hatch revealing the prog. You can actually make it to the egg before it hatches and you can kill the prog before it even comes out but usually this guy hatches before I find him so I'm, I'm SOL you know. I never actually ran into this guy in the original Pikmin so I don't know the context of when he showed up in that game but at least in Pikmin 4 this guy becomes a huge problem pretty quickly. Basically in this mode you have to guard these mounds for a certain amount of time or until you defeat all the enemies in the level and protecting these mounds is the whole point of these missions so if the enemies do destroy it, you lose the mission altogether. Well, in this mode, things do go to shit pretty quickly because you can be out like gathering Pikmin or something, or even have two mounds to protect at once. Then you just add in this giant smoky prog slugging its way toward the mound. I mean, there's usually no way around it. You're gonna have to fight it. Whether you want to kill it or simply stall it until time runs out is up to you, but this thing is pretty unnerving when it's within breathing distance of the mound. It's truly a balancing act of watching the timer go down, but at the same time watching your total amount of Pikmin drop because this guy is just extra gassy today. One of the worst things to me while fighting this guy happened in Pikmin 4. The game added in a new move for these new Pikmin called Glow Pikmin, wherein they can group up into a giant bright ball of light and basically stun the enemy and all hop on them at once, doing magic damage. However, I would not recommend using this on the Smoky Prog, as when I did, I sent all my Glow Pikmin right up this guy's gassy ass and killed all my Pikmin in one fell swoop. And if that doesn't spell out how devastating this boss can be, then I don't know what will. F this guy, dude. I want my Glow Pikmin back. All 45 of them I sent to the grave all at once. They all held hands as they flew up into heaven. The Cyborg Yeti and Ty the Tasmanian Tiger is one of the first experiences I had with megalophobia or the fear of large things, at least in video games for me. I'm sad to say I was a GameCube kid, so I never played Shadow of the Colossus growing up, so I, and this was my closest thing to it. And yes, I know, comparing this boss battle to Shadow of the Colossus is pretty much a crime. Like, great value wouldn't even begin to describe this comparison. But regardless, this big ass Yeti stands pretty tall, at least in comparison to Ty, so writing's on the wall here. The boss's name does bring his scary level down a few points for me, as it is fluffy, but that doesn't stop the fact that he was one of the scariest bosses for me to fight as a kid. First of all, the boss battle needs fire boomerangs in order to burn the robot yeti's skin off, revealing his cyborg exoskeleton. However, the game isn't super clear, or at least I wasn't that good at following directions, as I remember having the hardest time trying to figure out how to start the boss battle even. When I was a kid, I always thought you needed to slam this guy's fist down on these metal things to electrocute him or something, but they're actually just used in the second half of the boss battle. All the while I'm trying to figure all this out, Fluffy's fists are turning Ty into a nice porridge. 
Ooh, Goldilocks would eat this shit up, bro. Once you remove your dunce cap and equip the fire rings, you can begin to peel this guy's skin off layer by layer, revealing the second half of the boss battle. This is like a damn souls boss at this point or something. The second phase is a bit tougher as you have to blow up the fire that is now pouring out of these aforementioned metal vents. As you do this, the Yeti starts to sink into the ice, and I always thought this was kind of a cool little detail they added. Since you know, this guy is probably getting pretty hot at this point. The boss battle ends when the cyborg's head is the only thing sticking out of the ice. He can't do much more after that. And you find out it was being trolled by this lizard lady. Hey man, don't do that. Looking back, the boss isn't the scariest thing, at least nowadays, but the sheer size of the Yeti and the confusion mixed with the tense background music makes for a pretty scary situation for a kid back in the day. Anybody else experience Ty? There's some other fucked up bosses from this game I'll probably talk about in the future uh, from the first one and the second one. I'm not a huge Splatoon fan. My reasoning is the actual fun of the gameplay never actually clicked for me, and the fact I'm not huge on multiplayer first games like this. I know the games have single player campaigns, but I'm pretty sure most people buy these games for the online aspect, right? Splatoon seems like the last series that would have something scary or disturbing hidden within it, but when we consider that Splatoon does share some of its developers with the Animal Crossing team, it's no longer really a mystery to me, at least. In the first game, when visiting the Museum de Afonzen, you can run across these two large statues at either corner of the museum. If you do visit the museum in the game now, you likely won't hear or see anything out of the ordinary, and that's because the dark secret this room is holding is only able to be heard when you bring the game back into its night theme, which was only available back then during Splatfest in the game, and the first game no longer has Splatfest in it, so... This one's pretty much dead in the water. However, before these splat fests were over, someone was able to capture this creepy occurrence, and it is of the two statues in the museum giggling while the player walks around. This video right here was one of the only examples online of this occurrence for a while, but after gaining some popularity, a YouTuber by the name of Horse Feathers did their own investigation, where they proved that the laughs don't occur outside of Splatfest, but they actually took it a step further and modded the game to emulate the nighttime themed version of the level. Here he discovered that the laughs do in fact exist, and gained some pretty valuable information about the ghostly laughs. The laughs only occur a few times during the match time, and you can actually hear them as soon as you load in if you head to the center of the map fast enough. Apparently when you are too close to the statues, they are quiet, and if you hear a laugh while you're at a statue, it's likely the other statue laughing at you from across the museum. This is a pretty creepy occurrence, as there isn't a whole lot going on in here, especially now that it's empty and desolate after the ending of the Splatfest in the game. The laugh actually comes from another Nintendo game's boss, Coloctus. This boss was from Skyward Sword and was memorable for his ending death scene, which plays out like this. Huh, sounds a little familiar, huh? Yeah, so these laughs sound almost identical to the Splatoon statues, so some believe that these universes may be shared or this boss is somehow connected to the Splatoon world somehow, but this is more likely a case of shared assets or Nintendo allowing in-house developers to reuse older sound assets. Regardless, this easter egg, while pretty hard to find nowadays, is still a creepy, unnerving thing in an otherwise bright and colorful game. So I ended up missing a lot more information about the marvelous bridge ghost in Pokemon Black and White than I had initially thought in the first video. I honest to god forgot they made sequels to Black and White, so of course they would continue this creepy mystery in the sequel. That's on me. Near the location of the marvelous bridge, you can stumble across a seemingly abandoned building. Once you go inside, you will start to notice strange occurrences like the furniture shaking as you walk by, or furniture orientations completely changing when you come back to a room you once visited. After exploring the house a bit, you can find out more about the ghost girl from the Marvelous Bridge in the first game as this was apparently her family's house. Not only that, but we eventually find out she had been cursed by Darkrai to have a never-ending nightmare that would eventually kill her. The only way she could have stopped this curse in the first place was to bring an item known as the Lunar Wing to the Pokemon known as Cresselia. However, her parents were too late and her fate was sealed away forever by this evil Darkrai curse. It's even more sad when you look at the fact when you first interact with her in her house, she is not only looking for her parents but also her Abra, which was mentioned by the old lady on the bridge in the first game. This is also the reason you see 
her in the first game on that bridge as she was attempting to find Cresselia to reverse the curse. Man, somehow this little ghost Easter egg got way darker than I ever expected it to. The fact she was cursed by an already creepy looking Pokemon adds so much more depth to the Pokemon world for me as kind of an outsider to the series. Like, I've played a good bit of the games but kind of fell off after Diamond and Pearl, but I, I never understood the full extent of these Pokemon's abilities even being able to curse other humans, eventually leading them to their own death. This was a pretty wild little side story and otherwise huge Pokemon experience through both Black and White 1 and and two, and it's by far one of the most unnerving Pokemon sequences I've ever seen. Thanks to everyone who corrected me in the first video and provided additional information on this entry. Also, I did see some other people adding additional scary things from the Pokemon universe, so maybe I'll plan on covering some of those in a future episode. In the past, I've talked a lot about Donkey Kong 64 on this channel, but if you don't know, I have a large love-hate relationship with the game, like many people do. For one, I'm nostalgic for the game, but I find it difficult to go back to and play since I have the want to 100% the game, but that's a task I, I mean, I can't take on. Only somebody as crazy as this guy would accomplish that. The game definitely has its fair share of dark and creepy parts, as I talked about in previous videos with the Get Out sound effect in Ancient Aztec. Well, I want to broaden the scope a little bit and look at the game as a whole, along with a phobia known as autophobia. Autophobia is the fear of being alone, isolated, abandoned, and ignored. While I don't think I have this phobia per se, I think there are tinges of autophobia that come from some of these older Nintendo 64 games. And for proof, I want to bring to your attention the video that inspired this entry called Autophobia Images with the Donkey Kong 64 OST. I know this isn't exactly a new concept as the liminal imagery genre blew up a lot online in the past few years, and there's a lot of videos showing images like this accompanied by uncanny music, but I really like this one because it showcases a small part of Donkey Kong 64 that brought so much uneasiness to the game without even being that noticeable, at least in terms of being creepy, and that's the music. I think the worlds in Donkey Kong 64 do enough speaking for how expansive and open some of them can be, not to mention how empty they feel at times, so I think the music team worked over time to create tracks that match this theme. Either that or it was one of the biggest happy accidents the world has seen over. Shout out to my boy Bob. I say all this to say I think the music in Donkey Kong 64 not only are bangers, but also envelop the player in this indescribable uneasy feeling that did appear in other games of the same generation, but I feel like it was amplified here in Donkey Kong. The music is so bleak at times that when paired up with your average liminal space photos, it does invoke an uneasy feeling, at least in me. Who knows though, you could just be seeing a bunch of images of abandoned warehouses with some Grant Kirkhope banging in the background, but I see a representation of a feeling I had when I played the game as a kid that I couldn't really describe. You know, angry Aztec, seemingly small cave system, but at the same time is weirdly large and empty when you get on the inside of it. Or how about the nighttime portions of Fungi Forest? Need I go on? You know, like I could, I, I, I could go on for days about this game and why I find it creepy, but we should just move on. I haven't played much of Zelda Twilight Princess, but I remember my brother playing through the ice temple in the game and running across this boss, which was one of the only things I remember from the game all these years later, and for pretty good reason. Upon entering this level, you will meet Yito, the husband of Yita, who gifts her a fragment of the Twilight Mirror Link is after. After helping make a soup for a sick Yita, she gains the strength to show the player the mirror, which is located in her bedroom. After leading the player there, Yita will gaze into the mirror before starting to twitch quickly before full-on jump scares scaring the player with this. Jump scares in Zelda. Yeah, this is on some Lord Voldemort type shit, man. What the hell was that face swap? I feel like I'm using a Snapchat filter and I accidentally swapped faces with my sleep paralysis demon on accident. He was standing behind me the whole time. After this, Yida will transform into the level's boss known as the Twilight Ice Mask Blazetta. 
She has a few forms, but her first form takes on this large ice structure that you have to slam around the stage with the ball and chain item. I don't know about you guys, but I just see a frozen over Statue of Liberty here, so that does kind of ease the tension a bit during the segment for me. However, in the second form, she starts to throw huge ice chunks at the player from above as you try to stay one step ahead of the boss. The music during this segment is also pretty intense, so it adds to the uneasy feeling you have during this battle. You know, you're really out here fighting for your life. Luckily though, she's not the hardest boss in the game and can be taken down with relative ease if you know what you're doing. After the battle, Yido will return to her normal form before Yido busts in and comforts his wife. All in all, this was a pretty heartwarming scene and on the tail end of something like this, it actually plays off pretty well. See, not only can Nintendo be out of their mind scary, but they can actually be pretty wholesome at times. This exchange is actually what gifts the player their heart segment for the boss battle and this is a pretty cool little detail here guys. Regardless of the actual boss battle not being all that scary, the initial jump scare and shock of Yida's transformation has cemented itself inside my brain and many others for years to come. As mentioned before, Pikmin is usually a more cheery game, but that doesn't mean it doesn't come without its dark implications. Have I mentioned that Pikmin 1 is pretty brutal in its difficulty? It's by far one of the hardest games in the series, and that's due to the 30 day time limit the player gets to finish Olimar's quest. If they fail to collect the necessary ship parts within those 30 days, then the ending will play out differently than if Olimar escapes with all his ship parts intact. Much like the true ending, the bad ending to Pikmin 1 starts off with Olimar attempting to escape, full well knowing he probably doesn't have enough ship parts to make it, but calls it on anyway. That alone is a bit harrowing, but regardless, we do see Olimar take off into the night sky. After the results screen show up and shows how absolute shit you were at the game, it will cut to the bad ending where Olimar's ship can be seen tumbling back down to the planet. From here, we can see the Pikmin gather up Olimar's presumably heavily injured or even dead body and place him into the Pikmin's onion. This then produces an Olimar Pikmin, but when he comes out of the onion, it's just his decapitated head with a Pikmin sprout on top of it. And I gotta say, that's just messed up, man. I just spent 30 days with this guy and now he's just a head with a plant? Not only that, but when you consider Olimar is the only one who's able to pluck Pikmin, it seems Homeboy is going to be there for quite a while, at least until some rescue squad can come get him. <laughs> That's a Pikmin 4 reference. While the ending seems to take a more humorous approach to your traditional bad ending, it's the implications that strike the player after the credits roll on their trash run of Pikmin. Olimar is constantly talking about getting home to his wife and kids throughout the game, and now he'll likely never see them again, cursed to live out his remaining years as a Pikmin sprout. And who knows how cognitive he is anymore. He might not even remember he has a family at this point. Jesus, that's dark. Some people during the pre-release of Pikmin 4 believed that the Leaf version of Olimar in the game was a direct result of a bad ending in the game, which could still be true, I think, but I'm not sure. I haven't played Olimar's backstory in Pikmin 4 yet, so jury's still out on that one, but it's, it's highly unlikely. But anyways, this is definitely one of the darker bad endings to a game when you consider how far you've come on your journey, only to end up right back where you started. Banjo-Tooie is one of the deepest 3D platformers in terms of content. You're, you're stacking it full here with this one. The game was kind of shorthanded a little bit due to an overabundance and doubling down on the collectathon 3D platformer genre of the time, but I gotta say, there's a much bigger offender we've already talked about on this list by the same developers. Looking at you, big man. Overall, I look back on Banjo-Tooie with nostalgic bliss, and yeah, sure, maybe some of the larger levels feel a little bit empty and too big, but I can overlook this when it comes to the game's story, which sees the death of a lot of the game's big characters like Bottles. Today, I want to talk about what happened to the king of the Jinjos known as King Jingling. The race of Jinjos, once believed to be a race led by a godlike Jinjo known as the Mighty Jinjonator, has a new leader in this game being introduced in the way of their king. This guy is pretty down to earth, and overall is pretty nice to Banjo and Kazooie, which isn't a norm in this game. These guys get Bobby flayed throughout the whole adventure, guys. Holy shit. Hell, even Kazooie is pretty nice to this King Jingling guy, and overall, he's one of the more charismatic characters in the game, even having a small pet called Toot. Look at this little guy, he's so cute. Oh, Jesus, what the fuck happened? A little after leaving King Jingling's palace for the first time, Gruntilda rolls out her big bob gun to suck the life out of the Jinjo village along with King Jingling. 
This makes the surrounding area resemble that of the opening of the game Spiral Mountain, which was equally met with as much doom and despair. If you end up revisiting King Jingling after this sequence, you can run into a much more lifeless version of him. This is the zombified version of King Jingling, who is aimlessly walking around his palace, arms stretched forward like a typical zombie you'd see. He will end up attacking the player and is invulnerable to attacks aside from getting stunned a little bit. If you hang out in the throne room long enough, he starts giving players hints about upcoming bosses in the game which has led many to believe he either has information on these guys or knows the bosses personally, which is a little bit sketch. These, these bosses are not good guys, huh? King Jingling wasn't the only one devastated by Grunty's big gun as Toot was reduced to a pile of ashes with a pair of eyeballs. Not my boy Toot. Luckily for Toot though, and the king, this is all reversed in the ending of the game, but this doesn't stop the fact that this segment of the game is still pretty disturbing for a kid. It's even more eerie when you consider King Jingling could technically just leave his palace at any point and start terrorizing surrounding areas. Well then you just have a Mr. X situation and nobody wants that. And that'll do it for this video. Thanks for all of the suggestions in the last video. Again, if you want to leave your own suggestions in the comments down below, I will talk about them in a future video if they're good enough. And uh, yeah, I'll keep continuing this series, probably doing them in and out of other icebergs. Make sure you drop a like and a subscribe down below if you want to see more content like this. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.